Hi students, welcome back. We will now do the discussions on the MCA exam which happened today and I hope all of you have done very well and uh, wish you the best for the results. And uh, we will start with the questions which have come. See the questions, I have got around 17-18 uh, questions here with me and I am sure that uh, more of these will have come. But then uh, uh, whatever you feel are the suggestions to the questions and whatever extra you think has come in the exam, you can always uh, discuss in the chat and I'll answer you on the YouTube chat itself. And uh, we'll see how much we can recall even while we were doing this uh, discussions. Right. So, uh, which hyperthyroid drug is safer during the first trimester of pregnancy? Now, uh, when we talk of hyperthyroidism, we know that uh, there can be a lot of side effects uh, on the mother and on the fetus. So, when we want to control this, they have to be drugs which are safe in the first trimester. And then we have drugs which will be giving good effects on a long term during the second and third trimester also. So, the classical is that in the first trimester we give propyl thyroglycerol because it is safer and from the uh, second trimester onwards we can give uh, methimazole or carbimazole which are probably having uh, you know teratogenic effects but since 12 weeks have passed and organogenesis is over so there won't be much problems so first trimester we give propyl thyroglycerol and from the second trimester onwards we give methimazole or carbimazole so what is the drug which is safer during the first trimester this is one of the easy questions i think they wanted to give you marks straight away for this one so yes i hope all of you marked propyl thyroglycerol which is the correct answer here right so uh, we know that hyperthyroidism like we've taught you in the prep ladder notes that uh, it can cause preeclamptic toxemia thyroid storm preterm labor high output cardiac failure iugr and intrauterine death and the management is to give uh, propyl thyroid around 100 to uh, 150 milligrams three times a day and methimazole which is given it's around we start around 10 to 20 milligrams uh, in the initial days and then we maintain from 5 to 10 milligrams per day that's the dose which we want to give and uh, methimazole will have some embryopathy all of you know that that will cause uh, esophageal or coronal atresia and aplasia cutis which is a skin disorder now propyl thyroidacil is the antithyroid drug of choice even during lactation now, the best part of this is that the amount it goes into the breast milk is much less as compared to what is going when methimazole is given as the anti-thyroid anti drug while breastfeeding is on. So, uh, let us move on and see another question. Which of the following is the most common cause of postmenopausal bleeding? Now, this is that sitter and I hope each one of my students at least, you know, the ones who have gone through me and uh, all the live classes which we have had and all the uh, students who have got the prep ladder uh, app with you, I hope each one of you marked CS cervix. I hope you did not mark a trophy of the endometrium. Look, that is a western data and I know that senile endometritis on a atrophic endometrium can cause postmenopausal bleeding and uh, one of uh, the major books, you know, Novak's gives that and even Shaw's gives that. But these are western books. Data, we have to know Indian and Indian data is full of CS cervix. Please, I hope all of you marked CS cervix. If you are talking MCI exam, please, I hope you have marked CS cervix, right? So, the answer of postmenopausal bleeding in India, uh, yes, I hope nobody thought C endometrium. Please, C endometrium is seen in our country, but nowhere near the commonest. So, I will give you some data so that uh, you are able to correlate with the answer you have given of C cervix. So, if you see the I ICMR uh, affiliated sites where they have given that C cervix is a preventable disease. Now, C cervix is the second most common cancer among Indian women. It is the second most common cancer after CA breast. So, the commonest genital cancer of women in our country is CA cervix. So, CA endometrium is out of that discussion already. Now, the number of cases, I think uh, it is a little, uh, you know, the data, uh, you know, which is coming in this slide. I think this, uh, it is a little small, maybe you are not able to see this. Let me show you that number of new cases which are coming every year. This is 2018 data I have got for you. So, CA breast C in talking about both the sexes. Try and understand. Number of new cases of cancer in humans in India, men and women put together is CA breast is the highest compared to men and women both. So, that is the problem. It is a very common cancer of India that the new cases coming per year the highest is CA breast. So, women specific cancers are 
more than overall cancers of men and women put together. Now, see the next one. The next most common is CA cervix. Now, that's what I was trying to show you here, the one in orange. So, second most common cancer which is coming in the country when men and women are put together, the specific cancer when we are talking, one is CA breast and other one is CA cervix, the new cases coming in every year. Now, let us uh, see this even more closely, number of new cases in women, specific just for women, CA breast, you see so many new cases and then CA cervix, women specific cancer if you talk, then CA breast new cases are coming in much more than before that's why it is the most common cancer women in our country and ca cervix is the next most common one so ca cervix is that cancer whose incidence is increasing every year yes the rate of increase as compared to early years is reduced that's why ca breast is more we know that but ca cervix has new cases every year so many all right so please understand that ca cervix is the Cancer, which is going to cause postmenopause bleeding, cinematum is nowhere near the uh, discussion, and CA cervix is rampant in our country. So, when we talk about postmenopause bleeding, we think of CA cervix first. So, burden of the disease, one more slide I wanted to show you. More women in India die from CA cervix than any other country in the world. New cases of CA cervix detected in India 96,922 every year. Deaths due to CA cervix in India. 60,078 per year. So, if you understand this data, then you'll never say senile endometritis because of atrophic endometrium is the cause of post menopause bleeding. I hope you'll, uh, uh, you know, uh, correlate with this data which I've given you and don't get confused at all. So, CA cervix, post menopause bleeding, that's it. Question number three. Which is the common duration of secondary postpartum hemorrhage? Now, what is postpartum hemorrhage? That is the most common cause of maternal mortality in our country. If we say maternal mortality rate, in India it is 103 now, the, the figures which came around one and a half months back. So, when we say maternal mortality, in our country the most common cause is obstetric hemorrhage and in obstetric hemorrhage, what is the most common cause? It is the postpartum hemorrhage. Now, postpartum hemorrhage within the first one day is the primary PPH. This is all what we have always discussed, primary PPH is the one in the first 24 hours and after 24 hours, it is secondary PPH, but that is still 12 weeks. Yes, I hope nobody uh, marked on the 6 weeks uh, if there was a choice. So, from 24 hours, after 24 hours, up to 12 weeks of delivery, if a woman has PPH, that is known as secondary PPH. So, the most common cause of primary PPH, all of you know, is the atonic PPH and of secondary PPH is retained bits is the retained bits of placenta. So, what is the treatment of primary PPH? Yes, of course, you know the drug of choice for prevention and treatment is oxytocin. Then we think of methyl ergometrin, mesoprostol, dianoprostol is the best drug of all the drugs which we discuss. So, treatment of atonic PPH, all of you know, is to give oxytocin drugs, which can be oxytocin and then uh, methyl ergometrin and mesoprostol. And of course, the drug uh, which is going to work, if none of these drugs work, is the carboprost. And then we can think in terms of uh, carbidosin these days, but carboprost is still the best drug amongst all the drugs which we have discussed. And then the Belin suture and the internal iliac artery ligation and then the uh, specific point that anterior division of the internal artery should be ligated, all of these things you should remember. Now, the secondary PPH, the one which is discussion here. So, the secondary PPH is because of retained bits of placenta and the treatment of retained bits, please, is curettage. Retained bits is curettage. A retained placenta, suppose the delivery has happened and the full placenta is inside, that is manual removal. Retained bits, like the case here, that is a curettage. And what is the complication of doing a curettage for retained bits? Yes, Eschermann syndrome. Good. Uh, question number three, the answer is B, from 24 hours to 12 weeks. All right, we'll go to question number four. The legal requirement for medical termination of pregnancy includes the approval of two doctors. Among the following, which is the time period which best suits for this requirement? I think they're trying to say, what is the time when two doctors are required for the uh, decision and 
performance of a medical termination of uh, pregnancy. So yes, a gynecologist who is a, a MD or a DNB or a DGO or a person or a doctor who is trained in gynecology for six months or a person who has done uh, 25 uh, MTBs under the supervision of a gynecologist. These are the people who can do a medical termination of pregnancy. We know that very well. Now, when a person is doing a medical termination of pregnancy, now the rules since 2021 March have changed. We know that till 20 weeks what could be done is now we can do till 24 weeks but yes after 20 weeks to 24 weeks if you're doing a medical termination pregnancy here is the time when two doctors are required so uh, that part is very safe here now a very simple question so the answer to this one is b so this was the gazette which uh, was published in uh, march 2021 and uh, in this they have given that where the length of pregnancy exceeds 20 weeks but does not exceed 24 weeks in case of such category of women as may be prescribed by rules under the act if not less than two registered medical practitioners are involved in making the decision and performance of the mtp so that's also a straightforward question i'm sure you've gone through all of these because you knew the new act has come Question number five, a 34 year old woman presents at six weeks of delivery. She wants contraception for the next three years. What is the best contraceptive method in this case? So when we say a person, you know, when there's a blanket statement that uh, a woman is in the lactational period, what drug you can give, or what method of contraception you give, that time we do say that we can give progesterone only pills because that's a blanket question because there's no specificity here. Now, in this question, the specific period has been asked that at six weeks of delivery now she's come she had delivered now she's got the uh, the changes of pregnancy have had all now corrected she's gone back to a normal size uterus and what can be the best method so no doubt it is a intrauterine contraceptive device uh, implants can also be given but they have to be changed every two years and they've uh, asked that uh, for the next three years what she can do you know she wants a contraception for three years so implants most of them are changed every two years and implants are cumbersome although they are very effective and uh, going by the uh, journal uh, you know the population of a country that how many of them will come for implants it's a procedure which has to, I mean those implants have to be surgically inserted in the skin and removed every two years and then reinserted so how many people are going to follow that so very dedicated and motivated patients can uh, come for the implants and uh, generally it's not a very favor favorite kind of a conception the implants now intrauterine devices we've been able to convince a lot of women across the country the ones who are educated and the ones who are not so well educated all of them eventually do agree for the iucd and it's a process where you have protection against a pregnancy for three years or five years if you use the uh, 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 multi-load or if somebody uses the paragard the protection is up to 10 years so that's why we say uh, intrauterine device is a good option but the question is to choose between progesteron and copper tea. Now, between copper tea and progesterons, let me tell you one thing up front that IUCD with progesteron has the least failure rate of all the contraceptive methods. A hormonal IUCD has wonderful effectiveness, but the problem is the patient becomes amenorrheic and that is what is not liked with because the endometrium because of high progesterone makes the woman not have periods at all the high progesterone in the IUCD makes the endometrium totally atrophic and she doesn't get periods and she's always a little upset that i'm not going getting my monthly menstruation so all women we know that they would want to have periods regularly and not get pregnant at the same time so that's why going by all of that i would say the best answer is a copper tea so IUCD is an answer and if given a choice between copper tea and uh, IUCD with progesterone, I would mark a uh, answer A here. So uh, I hope all of you will also agree with that and let's move on to the next question. So question number 6, which of the following drug is used in medical termination pregnancy for a 20 year old female who is in early weeks of pregnancy? Early weeks of pregnancy, I think they are trying to ask you medical termination of pregnancy and all of us know that medical termination of pregnancy, uh, the drugs method of doing a termination of pregnancy by medical methods for 7 weeks if we use then it is 99% successful and for 9 weeks if I use it is 95% successful and in our country it is approved that we should do it 
till seven weeks in our country. It is not that you cannot do it till nine weeks. Please do not get into that kind of understanding. It is best that we do the medical termination of pregnancy by drugs in the first seven weeks for best results. It is not that you cannot do with drugs till nine weeks. Now, what is the method? All of you know that I think uh, the choices would have been a little different from what came here, but uh, uh, we have taken the liberty of just uh, you know just changing the doses and putting them front and back so that you people get a little confused in the choices. But yes, all of you know very well that uh, mifepristone and mesoprostol is that uh, combination. And mifepristone can be used. Mifepristone can be used from 200 to 600 milligrams. All right, and mesoprostol can be used up to 800 micrograms that is 200 micrograms into 4 tablets. So, the choice which I have here there is uh, 200 mifepristone into A and B and uh, 800 mesoprostol. I think the only mistake here is that the choice which came to me I think this 200 should be in milligrams that is all. So, choice C is the answer here 200 is fine it should be in milligrams here and mifepristone 800 micrograms. Please remember uh, the mesoprostol I mean to say is 800 micrograms and the tablet generally is 200 uh, micrograms tablet. So, we should give 4. So, the method of doing the medical termination of pregnancy by drugs is that you must always localize the fetus first by an ultrasound. Please do not do this without an ultrasound because the pregnancy might be in a uh, ectopic uh, location. So, you may kill the baby, but the baby will never come out and will stay in the tube and uh, it may cause pain, it may cause bleeding, it may cause a tubal abortion which is not as bad, but it may also cause a rupture of the tube. So, locate the pregnancy first. If it is only in the uterus, you should do this. If it is in the tube, then you have to do management of a ectopic pregnancy. So, locate the pregnancy. Yes, it is in the uterus. Now, give the tablet which is uh, uh, mifepristone 200 to 600 milligrams and after 24 hours, you can give the vaginal tablets mesoprostol 800 micrograms. After the tablets are given, bleeding will happen in 3-4 days. Now, the completion of the process is that you must do a check ultrasound after this. So, once all of this is done, it is 99 percent successful only if all of this is followed. Okay? So, 200 milligrams of mifepristone and 800 micrograms of mesoprostol. So, question number 7 identify the image. I think this was a straightforward question and uh, nowadays uh, we do not use the type 1, type 2 uh, and type 2 A and B, type 3 and type 4 classification of plasma previa. Here they have shown a uh, uh, uterus with a baby and a plasma which is totally covering the os. So, that is a placenta previa. Okay? And placenta previa there is only we call it placenta previa when it is partly or totally covering the os like in this case and we call it low lying placenta if the placenta is within 2 centimeters of internal os. So, these are the only two definitions of plasma previa now whether it is partly or totally covering that is plasma previa and it is called low lying if it is within 2 centimeters of the internal loss. All right, and please do read about plasma previa in every exam which you are giving. I am sure that all of you are now going to do your internship and you are going to prepare for your PG entrance and please questions on plasma previa, abruption, vasa previa will always come and please understand when a patient with plasma previa is bleeding, please do not do a perversion examination because see if it is already bleeding from here, if it is already bleeding from here and you put in your finger, you will cause more torrential hemorrhage. So, cardinal rule plus the previous presence to you with bleeding which is painless bleeding most of the time, please do not do a pervaginal examination. All right. So, answer is D here and let us move on and see question number 8. A 24 year old woman presented to the emergency room with fully outside cervix and a cystocele. What is the next step of management? So, uh, best step of management and next step of management, I think there is a lot of confusion how we go about. I am sure the language in the exam was much more clear. So, whether it is a 24 year old woman or a 34, 44, 54, whatever age group this woman has come with, she has come to the emergency room. The one thing which strikes here, if a woman with prolapse comes to an emergency room, it is most of the time for a acute retention of urine because the bladder has come out with the prolapse. So, when the bladder comes out with prolapse, you know, 
see the answer is specific treatment let me tell you why because if you see the uterus here and the vagina and the bladder rectum this i'm showing you from a right this is a seattle section this is the right seattle section so what has happened here the uterus has come out in prolapse like this so when the uterus is outside you can understand when the uterus comes out these vaginal walls they will also go out with the uterus now when the vaginal walls go out they'll pull the bladder and the rectum along with it see the bladder has also come out here and the rectum has come out here so when this uterus comes out this bladder here see the urine in this bladder is now the sac of the bladder is outside so every time she wants to urinate she cannot make a stream and the bladder will go on filling because it is hanging outside so what she has to she has to hold this uterus and push it back into a body with a hand so that the bladder now corrects and then she can urinate so the problem with this prolapse is most of the time when they come to the emergency room it is for acute retention of urine so what we do we of course we help her with immediate catheterization and at the same time we push the uterus inside and pack it up with the uh, you know uh, uh, vaginal packing which is soaked in acrifavin and glycerin so that the edema also reduces and the packing also helps treat a decubitus ulcer but yes very importantly the immediate relief of her uh, urinary retention so what we do the packing will help but even better is that if you have a pessary that pessary which can be inserted so that she has some dignity before a surgical management is planned so for immediate relief what we have to do we have to do a pessary treatment now if it is a old woman who is let's say beyond 50 then we'll do a vaginal hysterectomy of course always with a pelvic floor repair if it is a young woman who wants a menstrual function to be preserved and wants to have more children then we'll do a manchester repair also known as the for the gill repair of course uh, uh, you know donald did the surgery in the manchester city hospital first and then it was modified by for the gill so more or less the same surgeries so for a young woman we do a manchester repair where the tightening of the ligaments is done but also we say pelvic floor repair and in a nulli paras woman then we do a sling surgery now, why am I telling you all these surgeries? Because the permanent treatment is uh, surgical for these uh, prolapse cases. And I don't know what was the perfect question which came in the exam. So, if it was just, uh, um, it was just the uh, case which came that she came to the emergency room uh, with whatever problem, which is most likely retention, I will empty the bladder and insert a pessary for immediate relief and then plan a surgery. What surgery I'll do? Depending on the age group, I've told you. Right. Let's move on to the next question. Question number nine identify the image so they are trying to show us an image of uh, again a sagittal section much like what i drawn in the last uh, uh, slide so if you see in a sagittal section from the right side you're seeing this is the bladder here this is the uterus here bladder uterus and they are showing that from the bladder there's a passage from the bladder which is communicating to the vagina so yes if you see that magnified here from the bladder to the vagina there's a passage so that is what is a vesico vaginal passage or a vesico vaginal fistula so yes the answer is indeed a it's a vesico vaginal fistula and um, you know the best method to uh, localize the fistula uh, where is the location in the bladder the best method is to put a scope into the bladder so cystoscopy is the best method to localize the fistula of course we can also do the three swab test yes you people like that so much because three cotton balls you put here and you put some methylene blue into the bladder and depending on uh, which uh, one gets soaked which uh, cotton ball gets soaked you can have a good estimation of the location of the vesicovaginal fistula whether it's a high uh, mid or a low fistula but the best test if they ask it is cystoscopy of course the most common fistula is the mid vaginal fistula and it is most commonly due to obstructed labor 
So mid vaginal fistula because obstructed labor is the most common uh, vesicular vaginal fistula in our country. Right. So let us go to question number 10. What is the definition of a maternal death? Now maternal death is a woman dying while in pregnancy or in the first six weeks after the delivery. So while pregnant and immediately the first six weeks which is known as a puerperium is a time if a woman dies then we say that is a maternal death and maternal mortality rate like I told you it is 103 and now it is uh, you know it is reducing but I would always want to see it under 100. So we are reaching there less than 70 is even better. So that is the target less than 70. Why keep it even 70? Keep it less than 10 because 10 odd women dying every 100,000 we can't help because they can be things like a uh, embolism and amniotic embolism which sometimes is totally out of control of an obstetrician and which is the most common that is the amniotic fluid embolism is actually the most common cause of mental death in the western world they don't have pps deaths they prevent it at any cost hardly any pps deaths in the western world but yes we still have a lot of pps deaths so yes the most common cause most common cause is obstetric obstetric hemorrhage and in obstetric hemorrhage, the most common cause is PPH. Of course, it can also be uh, abortion related bleeding or it could be APH that is placenta previa abruption related bleeding. All right. Of course, it can also be thromboembolism in our country, but uh, uh, those deaths are there in our country. But uh, it's not that we don't know about them. But uh, we always want to take care of the ones which are commonly the causes causing a woman to die, and that is PPH. Okay. So, death of woman from pregnancy-related causes during pregnancy or within 40 days of pregnancy, 42 days of pregnancy, expressed as a ratio to 100,000 live births, is known as a maternal death. So that was a question I am sure the uh, preventive medicine people also are telling you much more in detail than this. Question number 11, a couple came to clinic with complaints of infertility on examination husband had gynecomastia and tall stature. What is a possible diagnosis? Now gynecomastia, tall stature I think giveaway all right all my friends from the MCI institutes and the uh, prep ladder students who have been reading the app straightforward i am sure i think none of you would have missed this as Kleinfelter's syndrome so my way of telling you is that a normal woman you know a normal woman with 46 xx is feminine two x chromosomes required to keep a woman feminine to give her the give her the physique which is required to be a normal woman and uh, a normal woman will have a bar body one bar body so 45 xo is a Turner syndrome you know that and she's less of feminine we know uh, she's got uh, of course apart from webbing of neck and low set hairline she has no breast development we say it's a shield chest and she doesn't have a properly made uterus and the ovaries are very small and because of small uterus and uh, not having uh, ovaries making estrogen there is primary amenorrhea so most common cause of primary amenorrhea is Turner syndrome now, why am I saying this Turner syndrome because Two X chromosomes give femininity, and if it's 45 XO, femininity is less. Now, the other way to look at things is that if a normal man has 46 XY as the karyotype, then 47 X XY. Now, this man has got two X chromosomes, so he becomes feminine. My method of understanding things, and this is actually true also. When there are two X chromosomes, this person becomes much more feminine. This person is tall, has got thin long limbs and has got central obesity and has got a gynecomastia and has got a high pitch uh, female type of voice also sometimes. So yes, that is indeed the Klinefelter syndrome. It presents with azospermia, which is a cause of infertility. Uh, more about this, uh, testes are absent or less developed. There is azospermia. Secondary sexual characters are not well developed. Uh, male sex organs are not developed like the vast difference, penis and seminal vesicles. There is azospermia like we said. Gynecomastia, high pitch voice and tall long limbs. Now, this person, why is it not Turner syndrome? I have already discussed. That is a 45 XO. Swear syndrome. Now, swear syndrome is a person looking exactly like a normal woman, has a uterus, tube, cervix, and a vagina which is communicating also upper vagina low vagina everything is formed but the person is a male yeah now swear syndrome is 46 xy female we have had a 
good long discussion about this in the app regarding Swear syndrome. It's a type of a gonadal dysgenesis happening in a man. So, kerotype is 46XX, uh, 46XY. I'm sorry. So, the kerotype is 46XY and the test is not working at all. So, when there's no testes, there's no androgens. So, intrauterine life, the androgens are required to make a male. That doesn't happen. So, Swear syndrome is a 46XY female. Now, testicular feminization syndrome is now of 46 xy kerotype again but here the androgens are not being utilized so the person is having testes the testes are indeed working but the androgens which are produced they are not working so there's a slight difference here because since the testes are working the testes will make anti mullerian hormone so the person will not have a uterus will not have tubes, will not have a cervix, will not have the upper vagina also. All of those Mullerian derivatives won't be there in a case of testicular feminization syndrome. So, Swear syndrome, the test is not working at all. The person has a uterus. But in testicular feminization syndrome, the test is working. The androgens are not being uh, recognized by the endogen. So, there is androgen insensitivity in a case of testicular feminization syndrome. So, person is feminine and uh, much uh, more feminine uh, you know we we say that this person is actually a pretty looking female but is in fact a male 46 xy that is what is testicular feminization syndrome so a lot of interesting reading to do when we see the chapter of intersex on the prepladder uh, app with obs and gynae do have a look into that and uh, uh, must correlate with whatever syndromes have been given in these choices this client filter syndrome question number 11 now let's see question number 12 Patient with breast cancer, she is under treatment with tamoxifen. She now presents with complaints of bleeding per vaginum. What is the most likely cause? Now, when there is a case of uh, CA breast and the hormone receptor positive type of CA breast, you all know that tamoxifen is given to, uh, it is also given for treatment, but it is mostly given to prevent a recurrence. Now, when we give tamoxifen, we know that tamoxifen is a selective estrogen receptor modulator. So, it's got an estrogenic and anti estrogenic action both. So, some places it is anti estrogenic like on the breast. So, that's why it's given for C breast follow up. But at the same time, tamoxifen is estrogenic on the endometrium. So, it can cause hyperplasia of the endometrium and it can, uh, the endometrium can become uh, localized hyperplasia and it can hang out from the cervix like a polyp or the hyperplasia can be generalized in the uterus and cause cancer of the endometrium. So, most likely the bleeding types, a woman having bleeding with tamoxifen, I would think more in terms of endometrial cancer than an endometrial polyp right now because she is uh, a follow up and uh, she already had a cancer of the breast and you also know that cancer of the breast and the cancer of the endometrium and cancer of the ovary, they all go together in a family. So, more stronger answer than a polyp would be the endometrial cancer here. So, most likely endometrial cancer and endometrial polyp both can be a problem with follow up uh, treatment of CA breast with tamoxifen. Better answer endometrial cancer, definitely not cervical cancer and fibroid uterus. So, yes, beneficial for women this tamoxifen with hormone receptor positive breast cancer given as 20 milligrams per day for 5 to 10 years after treatment of CA breast. But women on tamoxifen are high risk for polyps, endometrial hyperplasia, and cancer, also vaginal dryness and hot flushes because the anti estrogenic action on the vagina and on the brain will cause the woman to have this vaginal dryness and uh, hot flushes respectively. Okay. So, we will go to question number 13. Now, what is this instrument used for? I remember taking a revision for all my students who were in the live classes and uh, somehow this uh, uh, instrument I discussed with all of you and I am so uh, happy that this came in the exam. This is the Leach Wilkinson cannula. Okay, The Leach cannula like we just call it. The Leach cannula is used for, uh, you know, we it has got these screws on the top. So, these cannula is uh, inserted into the uterus some, somewhat like this and through this cannula we can put in a dye and do a histosalpingography. While doing a laparoscopy also we can do this that when I am doing a laparoscope and looking at the uterus, uh, my assistants from below can put this cannula and put in a dye like the methylene blue and it comes onto the fallopian tube. So, it can be used for histosalpingography and it can also be used for the purpose of doing the dye test in laparoscopy. So, yes. Uh, the answer for this is definitely histosalpingography. Now, you can see here, see this is the uh, a case of uh, 
histocytography which I am doing and see we have put in the dye and the dye has not come out in the fallopian tubes on both the sides here and here and what I want you to concentrate here is this cannula here the cannula with the serrations the markings on the side now I have just taken out the cannula at the end of the procedure so that is the leech cannula which we use for the purpose of doing the dye test or the histosalpingography all right let us go on to question number 14 Ritodrin to prevent premature labor will cause which of the following complications in a mother. So, Ritodrin you know is the uh, you know one of the favorite drugs for uh, controlling preterm labor and we use a lot of Ritodrin uh, intravenous type of Ritodrin when we are doing especially the external cephalic version there also. So, apart from preterm labor we want to relax the uterus for doing a version uh, around 35 36 weeks when we are doing a breech conversion to a cephalic or a transfer conversion to transverse like conversion to a cephalic. So, we use ritodrin to keep the uterus relaxed and also for preterm labor of course, we use ritodrin. Now, ritodrin is a beta 2 agonist and beta 2 agonists are known to cause hyperglycemia than hypoglycemia. So, yes tachycardia they will cause as a side effect tremors and pulmonary edema this uh, you know this beta 2 agonist the biggest problem all of these beta 2 agonists is the pulmonary edema and that is why nifedipine is the drug of choice for preterm labor because it causes the least pulmonary edema as compared to the all the other drugs which are used for good effect you know the good acting drugs for preterm labor in those drugs nifedipine is the best why because it is the safest on the heart when while giving the good results of stopping preterm labor so drug of choice no doubt is nifedipine uh, my favorite drug all of you know is of course magnesium sulfate but yes if they ask in the exam please write nifedipine is the drug of choice a to c man they will never say the drug of choice in any of the exams for you because there is a controversy between the Americans and the Britishers. The Britishers and the Europeans love A to c man Americans do not use it for preterm labor because they say it is not effective. So, they never say drug of choice is A to c man in any of your exams. I am very sure of that. Uh, you can see Williams obstetrics it is written that is a drug which is not approved for use in the United States. So, uh, that is why A to c man will never be asked as a drug of choice anywhere. Yes, you should know A to c man is a antagonist of oxytocin that they have asked you many times in the exam, but not as a drug of choice. So, drug of choice, uh, what do you have to think in between? Beta 2 agonist, nifedipine, magnesium sulfate, proestron, proestron is the safest tocolytic, but not the drug of choice. Magnesium sulfate, my personal favorite, but not the drug of choice because it causes neonatal hypotonia. But remember, magnesium sulfate is the only neuroprotective, only neuroprotective tocolytic. That is why it is an excellent drug. Drug of choice, nifedipine and Ritodrin causes all these side effects. So, uh, Ritodrin is a beta 2 agonist like um, other drugs like isosoprin, turbitalin, salbutamol and it causes nausea, tachycardia, tremor, headache, chest pain and pulmonary edema. And remember that activation of beta 2 receptors may lead to hyperglycemia via hepatic and muscle glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis. Right. Question number 15. Identify the image. Now, I am sure this image uh, keeps coming every second exam for the PG entrance and for the MC entrance all the time I have seen this image and this is to show that on a histosalpingogram there is this filling defect here. Can you see this filling defect? So, this is because the uterus is having some adhesion here there is some adhesion here. So, when there are adhesions here, everywhere there will be some dye going, but somewhere in the middle there will be a filling defect because of the, so it can sh take shape, this HSG can take shape of uh, uh, any type of uh, picture, but remember if they are filling defects, if the uterus is not uh, homogeneous, homogeneously opacified, if it is not homogeneously opacified, then we call it a filling defect. And it can be because of uh, some fibroids in the uterus, it can be because of polyps rarely, but mostly this kind when there is a small irregular kind of a uh, filling defect. In fact, there are two here in this picture, then we are thinking in terms of a Escherman syndrome or adhesions in the uterus or Sanaki. So, one of this is going to come in the exams, all right. So, the answer is Escherman syndrome, right. Question number 16. What will be the content in the given contraceptives? I think this was an easy sitter so that, you know, uh, you are sure that, you know, some questions they have given in a way that 
this many marks I am going to get an Northern Gaini uh, exam this time. So, this was one of them and all of you know that uh, today is a sponge which is inserted in the vagina before intercourse and uh, this will have a spermicidal uh, drug that is known as the nonoxinol 9. So, yes that was a simple one. So, it can be inserted just before coitus and it can be kept up till 24 hours. So, if there are multiple acts of intercourse in this 24 hours, this sponge will work. Okay. Uh, what should be the treatment of a 8 centimeter endometrial or a endometriotic cyst? I think they mean to ask you. So, this is a fairly large uh, endometriotic cyst. Uh, this is from one of my patients and you must appreciate the look of this. It is known as a ground glass appearance. It is a ground glass appearance. Now, I am um, not too sure whether it the age was given. So, again you know this is a quick recall and we are doing this uh, within uh, four or five hours of the exam. So, yes, uh, if you have more sessions we can uh, like I told you we will be discussing in the tab below and the chat will be discussing. I will give the answers here on YouTube itself. But then um, endometriotic cyst if it is in a young woman who is uh, having a lot of pain then I would do a cystectomy. If it is in a woman who is uh, planning for a pregnancy, again I would do a cystectomy because in both these conditions the cyst, why it is in question because it is more than 5 centimeters in size. So, less than 5, you know, it is not that it is a written rule, it is a general use, uh, generally used rule in the practice that if it is less than 5 and it is causing not much problem, we can manage medically. But if it is more than 5, then we go ahead and do a surgical management first. So, do a surgical management get a diagnosis it's certain what is the best method of doing the diagnosis of uh, endometriosis all of you know that it is a laparoscopy so it looks like endometriotic cyst it is a young woman with uh, pain abdomen and some menorrhagia i'm sure it is endometriosis ca 125 will be a little high but it is not a perfect diagnosis till you do a laparoscopy and a biopsy of this and the biopsy proven endometriosis so yes Anything more than 5 centimeters, it could be a malignancy of some type, you know, malignancy with some blood inside. So, I will first ascertain the diagnosis by doing a laparoscopy and a cystectomy and I know it is endometriosis, now I will keep her in a follow up with medical management. So, that is the best answer here. So, young woman with the endometriotic cyst which is more than 5 centimeters, think in terms of doing a surgical treatment first and then suppress her with GnRH or with OC pills progesterone, you know, there is a, uh, you know, we have given you a clip of just medical management of endometriosis on the YouTube from Preplata, please see that. Otherwise, uh, you know, in your app also you can go back and revise. Medical management of endometriosis after surgery is a must because 70, 60 to 70 percent recurrence can be there after endometriosis. So, I would say a cystectomy here. And uh, suppose it was a woman who was uh, 35, let us say, a 35 year old woman who has got a problem of endometriosis ever since she was 20. If a question came like that, you know, this is the uh, recurrence of a cyst, then I can say a needle aspiration of this cyst, which I do very regularly. Uh, I have shown you these videos also a couple of times during uh, our discussions of uh, MCQs in the app. So, yes, uh, we can do a cyst aspiration also because now I know that when I did the surgery for the first time, I know it is endometriosis which is recurring and it is not a uh, ovarian cancer. So, I know it is endometriosis and it is recurred, so I can do a aspiration. First time a woman comes with endometriosis doing an aspiration, not a very wise option. First, you should ascertain that diagnosis. So, to ascertain the diagnosis, to make sure that it is endometriosis, do the laparoscopic surgery first. Right, enough discussion about this. Uh, I am sure you will understand that uh, cystectomy is the answer here. And GNRH is one of the best medical managements which you can give for endometriosis follow up. And uh, that is given on a monthly basis or a three monthly basis. Uh, Luprolin is my favorite drug, but a lot of people are happy with giving Gosserilin also. So, we will uh, go ahead and say this is a case of endometriosis which requires surgical management. All right, guys. So uh, these were the came to me uh, around uh, 17, 18 of them, and uh, I've tried to discuss all the options. But yes, uh, whatever extra you people feel uh, came in the exam and was not discussed, please keep writing on the chat box. And uh, over the next two or three days, I'll give the answers to this ones, uh, the ones which we missed in the recall. All right. I hope you have excellent results, all of you. May God bless you. Thank you.